Before we begin, I wanted to get on my soapbox, just briefly address uh, YouTube, who will be listening to this. And, you know, I apologize for the last video, for the, the last attempt at blundering a piece um, being pretty vapid and devoid of instructive content. But I, I did want to say that, you know, the, the philosophy behind the speedrun videos on YouTube is to break them down into digestible uh, digestible chunks. And I would much rather err on the side of having a shorter video than cramming in four or five games. And I think I would caution people against thinking that just because the video is longer, that means that you necessarily learn more or that, uh, you know, or that it's, it's a linear correlation between the length of the video and the number of games I play and the amount that you learn. Learning doesn't work that way, in my opinion. And, and so... I would ask for everyone's patience. You know, some of these videos are going to be a little bit short. Some of the games are going to be shorter. Some of them are going to be longer. I don't control that. Um, and I want to give you the speedrun in its raw form rather than curate it and edit it into unrecognition. So uh, that's just how it is sometimes. With that being said, let's get started and let's try to blunder a piece. But let's do it a little bit uh, in a little bit of a smarter fashion than we previously did. Now let's start E4. We'll start with normal theory, and then at some point we'll veer off and, and blunder. There we go. Yeah, we're facing a Sicilian. Okay, so we're gonna start with an Alapin like we usually do. We're gonna we're gonna start normal, and then we're gonna blunder something. Okay, so we're gonna play D4, which is theory. E6. Okay, now I'm gonna make one more developing move, knight c3. Probably I should have gone bishop g5. That would have been a great opportunity to blunder. Because now he's probably going to go knight f6. And he won't permit me the opportunity to do that again. Wiz, thank you for the 13 months. Bishop g, bishop b4. Okay, this is the great opportunity that we have. I'm going to go bishop g5. I feel like it's a pretty believable blunder. Um, okay, looks like I'm developing a piece at least. The funny, the hilarious thing would be if he doesn't take the bishop. Um, that would be hilarious. But I think he will. I mean, 1400 should understand. Hey, this is a 15 minute game. If it was a bullet game, I'd understand. All right. Take my pieces, please. God, I never thought it would be so difficult to blunder a piece. Who knew? This is one of the hardest things to achieve in chess. And now he's... Oh. Okay, so he's played bishop takes c3. Now I think he'll take my bishop. Okay, yes! We got it. Attempt number two. And we've made it even harder on ourselves because I have allowed him to trade another pair of miners. Now, let's get serious. That was funny. Let's get serious. Let's start the recovery process. Okay. This is very difficult. We're down a full piece. We've traded another pair of miners. And the first thing to get out of the way is that the movie five does not win the knight back. Okay. The movie five does not win the knight back. This, and everybody should know why. This is a concept that even as a total beginner, you should be aware of. Um, and black plays the counter attack h6. And if bishop drops back to h4, then black once again attacks the bishop with g5, unpinning the knight. If the bishop drops back to g3, then the knight is free to move because it's no longer pinned. But what, people, what some people don't always realize is that after e5, h6, um, white has, uh, in certain situations, this being one of them, a very interesting attempt to complicate the game. So I'm going to play e5. Yeah, so yeah, h6, g5 doesn't really ruin black structure. It's, uh, it's a little bit weakening, but since we're down a piece, weakening is not enough. We need something more concrete. We need to complicate the game in a more... Uh, in a more how should I put it? Um, you know, we really need something more complex than just inducing a small weakness. That's not going to cut it. So what am I thinking about here? Yeah, Greg Connor got it. So I'm thinking about playing e takes f6. Okay, well, black's going to play h takes g5. And then we take on g7. Now, that's not the end of the story. Because if you calculate one move further, you will see that black plays the move rook g8. And at first sight, it may seem that 
we cannot defend the pawn on g7. We can't defend it directly, but we can try to defend it indirectly. Who sees how? Who sees a tricky move after rook g8 in that position? Very good. We can play queen h5. We can play queen h5. And if the rook captures the pawn, then we're going to have a fork with queen h8. Now, obviously, black doesn't have to take on g7 there. But insofar as recovering from a blunder, you know, I, I want to emphasize this straight away. The recovery rarely happens uh, over the course of one move. You have to build up the tension. You have to complicate the game. And uh, you have to sow the seeds of doubt in your opponent's mind. Make make your opponent believe uh, that that he or she is going is starting to go wrong uh, and is is making more weaknesses in, in their position. He takes f6. Let's go for it. I mean, this is really as good an option as any. Now we play f takes g7. And we just want to sow a little bit of doubt in black's mind with a move queen h5. And maybe he'll take on g7 straight away. Uh, that's also possible. That's a pretty typical blunder. But I think at this level, he will probably play the correct move, which is queen f6. Queen f6 gets the queen out into the into the game and prepares to take the, the pawn on g7 with the queen. Okay, he found it, of course. That's a pretty obvious move, and that's okay. Uh, because we have created something resembling a, you know, a weakness on the king's side. We put ourselves in a position where later on, if the king's side were to open up, yeah, we might have certain attacking chances. Now, I'm talking about the king's side opening up. But right now, the king's side isn't really open. We have a single queen here, but the queen alone is not going to create any significant problems for black, we need other pieces. Now you might say, okay, well that means we need to develop our knight. And knight f3 is a pretty pretty reasonable move. But I think that we can play in a more tricky way. I think that we can open up the king side and try to involve the h1 rook, which uh, is you know has more meat on the bone than knight f3. Yeah, h4 for the boys. That's exactly right. Let's throw in h4 and for the girls. And uh, we're posing black with a dilemma. And that's really all that you can do when you're lost, when you're down a piece. Another technique that you can use in order to uh, get back into the game and try to induce mistakes is pose your opponent, confront your opponent with decisions. People hate decisions. And when you force your opponent to make several decisions in a row, um, there is such a thing as decision fatigue, where with every subsequent decision, that's a thing in, I think, psychology, uh, your ability to make further decisions diminishes. And again, you're causing your opponent to feel just a little bit of doubt in his ability to win the game. Okay, well, g takes h4. Obviously, we don't take with the queen. That would offer a queen trade and be counterproductive. We want to take with the rook and get this rook into the game. Maybe later we can lift it to f4. Right now, there's absolutely nothing that we can do. We need more pieces in the game. Okay. Now, this is another another opportunity that we have to complicate uh, the game. Because what is black currently threatening? Well, what does black want to do here? Well, black wants to take on g2. That's right. And so a lot of people here would, and I'm sure some of you guys are thinking, well, let's play g3. Well, you're not going to recover from a piece down uh, if you play moves like g3, because that's not creative enough it's too straightforward and it's too predictable. You want to find something unpredictable and interesting. Uh, and the most important thing is that this knight is out of the game. We literally don't have any minor pieces left. We cannot afford uh, to have our only remaining minor piece falling asleep. So the question we want to ask ourselves, uh, and I call this the Sam Shanklin question, what happens if you do it anyway? What happens if we just ignore the pawn on g2 and go knight f3? Well, let's consider that. And you guys are already indicating the correct follow-up move. If black takes on g2, we have not lost our castling ability. We can castle queenside. That gets the last piece into the game. And guess what? That position looks a lot more complicated. That position looks as complicated as we can possibly get it. If black reacts well in that position, we're going to lose the game. But this is the best that we can do. So at least we can generate... Oops! And I, I'm i sorry. I, mix, I mixed up the move order. I was talking about castles, and I played it first. And this is a mistake. Uh, this is a mistake because it allows a queen trade. I, I'm sorry about that. I had a little mental mental snafu. Yeah, this is uh, this happened to one of my opponents in a classical game, uh, which resulted in a peace boner. I'll show you guys afterward. That's okay. We move on. 
this does complicate things, and I really hope that he will be enticed by queen takes g2. Then there will be no harm, no foul. Uh, but if queen g5 check happens, that results in an endgame, and that's going to be incredibly hard to recover from. Jesus. Rip. Yeah. I mean, I was just talking about castles long, and I forgot that we didn't play knight f3. Uh, this is a big, big moment. Queen g5 check essentially wins the game. Not, the, not to say that we won't continue trying. I will pull every single GM trick out of the book. I promise you that. Uh, I will make him work for it. Nope. He does not go for the queen trade. He goes 97. The problem, folks, is that 97 is also an excellent move. I mean, the knight heads over to g6 or f5. That's just a phenomenal defensive move. Probably not even worse than the queen trade. But at the very least, it gives us the opportunity to develop our knight and avoid the queen trade, which is really the, the most that we could possibly ask for here. Knight f3. Okay, at least we keep the queens on the board. I feel a little bit better here. Yeah, GMs don't die easily. So hopefully it makes sense what we're doing so far. We're trying to complicate the game. Uh, obviously, we're trying to generate chances against our opponent's king, uh, which is really the only thing that we could possibly do in such a situation. Um... And, and hopefully that ultimately gets gets our opponent nervous. Bishop b7. How should we proceed? How should we proceed? Well, this is a very unfortunate situation for us. Because if we play the obvious move, which really is knight e5, centralizing the knight. Yeah, unfortunately we let black trade queens again. And you know, that's just something we're going to have to roll with. Because if we don't go knight e5, we don't play that. Uh, Black is going to capture the knight, and without any minor pieces, I really feel that our chances are going to be a lot less than our chances in the endgame. Because in the endgame, we will have an active knight, and we will have an h-file, and that's already quite a bit of stuff to work with. And we could still generate tactical ideas, even without queens on the board. I'm pretty confident of that. I'm pretty confident of that. So, even after queen g5 check, I feel like we're going to have... Uh, reasonable chances to to pose problems i i already see an idea i mean i know it sounds ridiculous but this is really what i want to show with this game even if i lose it that you know the magic of chess is that even in these absolutely lost positions if you play in a pur purposeful way if you uh if you do stuff specifically aimed at making your opponent's task hard uh and you don't shoot yourself in the foot you're going to pull out a lot of these games. Rook c8, hitting the pawn on c3. Now, this is a pawn that I think we have to defend. Uh, by the way, Rook c8 does uh, preclude black from castling, which is a little bit somewhat encouraging. Well, we want to defend the pawn, but we don't just want to defend it with a move like king b2 or c4. Some of you guys are proposing king c2, but you know that doesn't squeeze the most bang for our buck. We have to get bang for our buck. We have, Every single tempo is golden. So if we're defending the pawn, we better bring another piece into the game. And as I'm saying that, you are very correctly indicating that I think rook d3 is the best practical chance. How does that bring another piece into the game? Well, it prepares to lift the rook to g3. And guess what? If we get that rook to g3, we're going to have all of our pieces on the king side. And that is going to be nothing to sneeze at for black. So let's go rook d3. Again, notice that queen takes g2... Uh, is possible but very dangerous due to queen takes f7 check. We are allowing a queen trade, but the idea that I spoke about previously still persists after queen g5 check. I still have an idea, and there we go. So we have to take... Now, here's the idea. What do I see here? I feel like our only chance is to somehow use our knight and get it to one of black's weak squares, maybe to d6. Ideally, our knight would somehow find a way to land on d6. Now, rook h8 is check itis. That's a completely empty check because black just covers it with his rook. Rook h8 check, just rook g8. And you're only throwing oil onto the fire uh, by saddling yourself with a potential rook trade. Knight c4 blunders the knight. That would be great, but it blunders the knight. How else can we possibly get this knight from e5 to d6? Well, we can get it through c4. Unfortunately, that's not possible. We can also try to get it through f7, knight f7, knight d6. Well, we can't play knight takes f7, that blunders the knight. What we can do is try to attack this pawn on f7 and try to trick him, get him to go f6, and then swing our knight through d7, through f7 to d6. It will take a miracle. Now, there are a couple of ways to try to do that. Rook f3 blunders the rook. Don't forget about the bishop, folks. 
Rook F4 is not the best way to do that because black can just advance the F pawn and that's the problem with attacking a pawn from the front. You often want to attack a pawn from the side because that it's, it's a lot harder to stop knight f7 here than it is after rook f4. Now, unfortunately, there is uh, an immediate refutation for black, which I see and which I'm hoping he misses. And at the, at the end of the day, that's all that you can really hope for. I'm hoping that he plays f6 here. If I have the right understanding of, of this level, I think we have a non-zero chance of pulling out a miracle here. Yeah, bishop e4. Unfortunately, bishop e4 is the move. The game is still not over after bishop e4. We still have another chance. You guys see it, obviously, because I mentioned it. But put yourself in his shoes. He doesn't know that this move exists, necessarily. I am really hoping for f6. The, the time control is also not our friend. It's such a such a long time control that I mean, he's got all the time in the world to find the stuff. Yeah, the likeliest thing is that we lose this game. I mean... There is only so much that I can do uh, down a piece. If somebody's playing up to a decent level, you're going to lose. But uh, we're still hoping. Okay, like I said, I have a pretty good understanding of how people at this level tend to think. And this is exciting. Knight f7, here we go. Now we're getting somewhere. And here's the thing. If he goes bishop e4 now saying, okay, well now I'm going to take one of the rooks. No, 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 that doesn't work anymore because we get our knight to d6. Okay, now what should black do here? What should black do here? No, what, king f8, the rook is hanging. Guys, the rook is hanging. Rook d5. Rook d5 is the move here for black because that moves the rook away and it defends the d6 square. But guess what? What is the drawback of the move rook d5? Well, let's think about it. It moves the rook away from the g file. Well, do we have a piece that can potentially exploit that drawback and it can access the g-file? We do. We have a rook on d3 that could move to g3 and create possible ladder-made ideas, which will be impossible straight away because there's a knight on e7. But you can already see that storm clouds are beginning to gather around Black's king, even though it's the end game. Rook h8 check blunders the knight. Rook h8 check would blunder the knight. No, that's not rook h8. In order to be able to play rook h8, we would need the other rook to be on g7. We would need both rooks defending the knight so that one of them uh, could relinquish its duties and move on to greener pastures. e dog. Oh yeah, after rook d5, if I get out of the pin, c4 is a potential idea. Yes, that's true. Although there is a rook on c8 that's, that would be guarding that square. Now this is exciting because you can already sense that our opponent is, I wouldn't say starting to crumble, but definitely feels a bit of fear. He probably sees this and this, and players under 1,500, they, they tend to get, and I don't mean this in a demeaning way, but I'm sure those of you in the chat who are in that rating range, I feel like, at least from my experience with students, they tend to get overwhelmed when there is more than one threat and when there are, you know, when there are very scary ideas like Knight D6. These big threats can become overwhelming and can cause panic and subsequent blunders. And if you're on the reverse side of this, if you're playing black here, it's very important to try to nip that in the bottom to basically break the position down into its component parts. Where exactly is the danger coming from? If you ask yourself that question in that way, it becomes less overwhelming. Well, where is the danger coming from? It's coming from three different sources. The first is that the rook is hanging. The second is that knight d6 is a massive threat. Both of these can be solved with the move rook d5. That everybody should see. The third source of danger is that all of a sudden the king has become a has become a serious weakness. Um, and that I'll talk about after the game. But knight f5, he decides to defend the d6 square but not move the rook away. Obviously, we should take the rook and at least we win back some material. We are still much, much worse here, but at least we're getting somewhere. Okay, now how do we think about this position? Well, let me take a second and think about it myself. I have an idea. I have an idea. Okay. So I think a lot of you are probably tempted by the move g4. If I, if I understand the chat, you're probably tempted by the move g4. Not a bad move. Not a bad move at all. Uh, chasing the knight away from what is definitely a very good square. g4 is one of the top candidate moves. Um, now after g4, the knight's going to move back somewhere. Probably after g4, the knight's going to move back to e7. 
And then we could swing this rook back around to h3, preparing some sort of h-file battery. Uh, that would be a very interesting approach. But I think I have a way that we could improve upon that idea. I think I have a way that we could improve on that idea even further. The way that I'm thinking about this is rook h8 check would win the rook if it weren't for the b7 bishop, right? If this bishop was somehow distracted from b7, this would win the second rook. Um, with supreme, rook h3 doesn't actually threaten anything because rook h8, king e7, rook h7, the king can escape to d6. It's less dangerous than it looks. Now, can we entice black to move this bishop away from b7? Do we have at our disposal something to bait black's bishop with? We do. d5. But the point of d5 is not just to distract the bishop. That's not the only thing we're doing. We are doing something else that's very important, which is that we're, we're opening up the position. And if black plays e takes d5, look at how much black's position is weakened. The knight loses its defender. Um, which enables moves like rook f3 to be played. Previously, that was impossible because the bishop controlled that square. In addition, we open up the e-file, which means that after the knight moves away from f5, rook e3 check could be dangerous as well. But what if black ignores this? What if black does nothing? What if black makes a random move? What threat does d5 actually pose? And in order to answer this question, you have to notice the x-ray. Yeah, we're threatening to take on e6 quite simply, and after d takes e6, the bishop on b7 hangs along the 7th rank, causing more problems, posing decisions. And I feel like, if I again, if I understand my opponent correctly, this is the moment where he might panic and blunder. I'm sensing that we might see a blunder in this position by black. Whether it's bishop takes d5, or not seeing rook d takes e6 playing a move like rook c5. I could see that too. No, e takes d5 is not the only move. I'm sure there are several possible moves. There's the move e5 here, which is also very good. And yeah, it's possible that our opponent plays e5 as well. I wouldn't be shocked if that happens. I wouldn't be shocked if that happens. But that that is still a very encouraging sign, even if that happens. Yeah, that endgame is holdable, but after e takes d5, we will not play rook takes d5. That's unnecessarily fancy. We want to keep both rooks on the board. Okay, I I was proven wrong. Correctly playing e takes d5. But it took him a while to play that. Okay, let's not lose lose our spirit. Well, we have several ways to proceed here. But I I'm sensing a very interesting idea that I feel like could put us over the edge. Now I feel like we should play g4 because I want to have the possibility of giving a check on e3. And I also have a secondary idea that I'm not going to reveal just yet. Although you guys can start thinking about what, what you think that might be. It starts with g4 though. So let's everything, all, all the good things in life start with a move g4. Black's move is essentially forced. He has to go to d6. Do you guys see what will happen if he goes back to e7? If he goes to e7 as human correctly points out there's rookie three pinning the knight from two different sources and winning the knight and after knight d6 we are going to execute that secondary idea of the move g4 if somebody can guess it i'll be pretty impressed what am i thinking about here and think of it this way we have maximized the activity of the rooks excellent i'm thinking about the move f4 breaking through and creating a pass pawn not just any pass pawn a pass pawn that is essentially going to be born on g5. And in conjunction with a rook that cuts off the king along the seventh rank, you have to understand that a pass pawn is a terrifying force. Rooks are second to none in, 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 in supervising the progress of pass pawns. That's a very important thing to understand. So we play the move f4. We try to compel him to take. And then we shove this pawn forward as far as it'll go g5, g6, and hopefully g7, g8. What we're also trying to do, the reason we're operating with such a sense of urgency is that black is currently very passive. Look at his bishop. It's staring at the pawn. Look at the rook on c8. It's not a very good rook. It's staring at the pawn on c3, but that's not doing much. Our rook on d3 is doing a perfectly good job of defending that pawn on c3. So we're trying to take this opportunity to push this pass pawn as far as it'll go before black has had a chance to consolidate. What's the evaluation here? White is definitely still losing. I have no, no doubt that with accurate play, 
black can consolidate and win. But it's already become so much more difficult to do that than it was even a couple of moves ago. Knight e4. Well, what should we do now? What should we do now? We close our eyes and we play this move. We push the pawn, of course. Very good. We play g6. King f8. Nope, that's a good move. Hmm. Let's think. I need to think. Let's break this down. Let's understand what's going on. What does black want? If it were black to move here, what would he do? What is black's threat? Black wants to take, rook takes c3. In my opinion, black wants to take on c3 with the rook. And as I'll show you guys after the game, um, the issue with those types of positions is that we will be left with only one pawn. And that one pawn, well, we're, we'll be left with the second pawn on a2, but that's not a very serious one. And I'm really afraid that that pawn on g6 is going to be restrained successfully by black's king. Because if we play g7, the king just steps aside to g. Does that make sense? So if we play rook f3, then after rook takes c3 check, we have to trade. And I'm just not convinced that that resulting position is totally winning for us. In fact, I don't know how to evaluate it. I feel like it's quite unclear. We have interesting options there. But if black plays accurately, I think he should be totally fine. So then the question arrives, well, can we defend the pawn on c3? Can we prevent rook takes c3 from happening? We can. We can do that by unpinning the king and playing king b2. These are the kinds of moves that win games. It's the moves, the patient moves, that keep the tension in the position. Right? Not only does this keep the tension, this improves our position. Because rook takes c3, even if it does happen, is never going to come with check again. So we're attacking the pawn on d7. We're threatening rook f3, rook takes f4, as you guys were all indicating. And we're keeping the tension in the air as much as possible. And there we go. There's the blunder. The tension kills. There's the blunder. That blunder's a piece. And uh, why does that blunder a piece? Well, there's a pawn on g7. What square is this pawn controlling? It's controlling the square on f7. What can go to f7? A rook. What does this do? This forks the king and the knight. Boom. We take the knight. We still have some work left to do. Okay. Now, I know that most of you are probably going to be tempted by the move rook f7 check. But wait a minute. Am I ready to give up this g6 pawn that easily? Absolutely not. So therefore, I know you guys are now thinking of the move rook d6. But I'm actually thinking of a third move. Here's what I see. What I see is that if the king takes the pawn on g6, essentially the king is going to be one file away from getting ladder checkmated. Let's imagine that the pawn on f4 was gone. Do you guys see what happens after rook takes f4, king takes g6? What happens? Black gets ladder checkmated. This is a classic ladder mate. We go rook g3 check. And all we need to do after king h5 is get this f rook away from h4. We can go rook f1. We can go rook f7. Um, and essentially the game is over. Well, we can do this in a variety of ways. Uh, if we want to be like super incredibly accurate, I would go rook f2 rather than rook f1. Or I would go rook f7. Because rook f1, maybe black still has the move d4 in order to open up the bishop and defend h1. Uh, so, so accuracy until the end. Rook f7 is good. Rook, rook f2 is good. I don't think it really matters. I, I'm going to go rook f2. Now, black can stave off mate with the move rook c4, intending rook h2 check, rook h4. He goes king h4. That's great. Now we need to move this rook. Where do we move it? And the, the rule of thumb is that you want to move your rooks as far away from the king as possible. And you also want to keep the rook active. So rather than just going back to g1, why don't we squeeze the most out of this move and go rook g7? And this is kind of like a life insurance policy. If you fail to give the ladder mate for whatever reason, you can always still capture the pawn on d7 and win the game just by vacuuming up all of the queen side pawns. We're also up material. Okay. What to do now? Now we need to continue overextending Black's forces. Rook f6, not quite. Not rook f6. Well, I feel like... Let me think about this for a second. Rook f6, there's rook c6. Rook f6, there's rook c6. I'm going to play a very tricky move. Check. 
I'm really hoping for King H2, by the way. If he goes back to H4, we'll repeat moves. But this sets a trap. You know, actually, yeah, I mean, the problem is I thought Rook F5 wins the game here, but I guess he's got Rook H8. I guess he's got Rook H8. I missed it. I missed Rook H8. Yeah. And I made a mistake because Rook takes D7. He's got Bishop C8 now with a pin. <laughs> so what do we do? We just don't quite have enough pieces to deliver the ladder mate. But something, some piece is feeling lonely. There is a piece here that's feeling lonely. There's a piece here that's saying, hey, your rooks aren't uh, successfully accomplishing this task. What about the king? Black is totally tied down. There's nothing that black can do here. Let's get the king in. Notice that I didn't play king c2, which would have allowed d4 with the idea of forking uh, the king and the rook with bishop d4 check. We go through c1. We go through the dark squares. That's a good rule of thumb. When your opponent has a bishop of only one color left, it, especially if you're in time trouble, try to put uh, your pieces on the other color square, particularly your rook. This is a lot more complicated than it looks. A lot. Let's go to d2. I mean, we're trying to win this like quickly, and I'll be honest, I didn't expect uh, black to resist this long. And what we might end up doing if black plays rook g3 here is just trading rooks and winning the game just by taking all of black's queenside pawns. Okay, bishop c6. Let's keep going. Well, again, if we keep going, we give up the pawn on c3. It's the fastest mate here. Let's go rook g5. I'm gonna create a I'm gonna create a trap. I'm hoping for a move like a5. Do you guys see what I'm preparing? Yeah, rook g2 checking h1, rook g1 check, and then rook back to g2. I want this rook away from h3 so that I could keep pushing my king forward. No, black is oh, and that oh it's it's so close to mate. Rook g2 check forces king h1 because king h3, there's rook g3 mate. But um, I think we can take this opportunity and just bring our king forward. Just get our king further, further, closer to f2. We continue to tighten the screws very patiently. No, eventually black will blunder something here. I mean, he's defending like Caruana right now. <laughs> the bishop is blocked. Yeah, d4 check is possible, but then we're, we're going to take that pawn. Look, I'm sure I missed a faster win, but... Ultimately, we're we're playing decent moves. I think that I'm I never really let this let this out of my reach. In one of my own blitz games, I would have won this in a different way. I wouldn't have even bothered with the ladder mate. I would have essentially forced a rook trade. Is what I would have done. That's another great move. Wow. Essentially preparing to give me side checks. Let's give him a check. Let's see where the king goes. He is defending this amazingly well. And here, king h3 loses, I'm pretty sure. He has to go king uh, down to h1. I mean, he is playing as well as he can play. Uh, but it's still completely lost. That's the thing. I don't think that he's going to survive this for much longer. Because after king h1, we can get our king. Okay, he goes king h3. And I want to show you guys a very important ladder made technique. What do we do now? Who sees it? I think we're very, very close to delivering checkmate. We need to get our king down to g1 in order to prepare rook h2 checkmate. Do you see how we involve our king in that way? So we go king f2. We go king f2. We're threatening rook g3 check and rook h2 mate. And we're also threatening king g1 followed by rook h2 mate. He's probably going to give us a check on f6. And then we tuck our king on g1 and finally... We have hit pay dirt because rook h2 is going to be unstoppable. Smart, right? D4 doesn't defend against the first threat, folks. D4 doesn't defend against the first threat, which is rook down to g3 check. King h4, rook h2 mate. Why couldn't we do this previously? Because previously the rook on g3 would have been undefended. As it stands, we have brought our king to f2 for the specific reason of guarding the g3 square. Does that make sense? Down to g3, check. Out to h2 with mate. And there we go. There is the full recovery. Woo! What a game. That was a really, really tough one. I hope you guys enjoyed it. Um, I certainly did.
That was a that was a lot of fun for me too because it's this really presents a challenge for me. I have to very seriously, con you know, I have to play accurately because we really don't have much margin for error. Now this was hilarious. E6. So by the way, what's funny about the way he played in the opening is that this knight c6 e6 thing was played against me many years ago in a game that I have shown champ with the five subs. Let's go. Loving it. Uh, this was played against me in one of my shortest ever tournament games, which I managed to win. Oh my goodness, we are I'm getting drowned with subs right now. Muradain with the sub go heals. Uh, and I want to show you guys this game again. I've shown it on stream many, many times. 13 move game precisely in this line. And this basically shows how white actually should play against this line. So 2005, and I practice what I preach. I played the Alapin really all throughout the start of my chess career, as I told you guys, up until the time I was around 1900. Whoever combat, thank you for the seven months. 100 bits from Wiz Supreme. Okay, there you go. There's E6, you see? Now, what should white actually do here? Well, white should just develop. Knight F3, Knight C3. And in this position, my opponent played a fatal mistake, believe it or not. Bishop E7. This loses the game immediately. Who can tell me why? Wow, it was 17 years ago. That sounds crazy. This looks like a nonchalant developing move. I mean, how bad could this be? Boom! D5. Okay, well, what's the big deal? My opponent takes on D5 and swings the knight up to B4. D6! The pawn... I mean, anytime this happens, this is almost always deadly. Because if the bishop drops back, you have queen E2 check. And uh, that's it. The, <laughs> the bishop has to return to E7. Um, my opponent makes a very miserable attempt at, you know, trying to survive. He plays bishop takes d6. Zayo, thank you for the tier one. I take it. This is the least scary fork of all time. And after bishop c4, uh, the rook is coming to you. On a, just look at this position. <laughs> knight e4, rook e1. Uh, I didn't even take the knight. I played rook e1 straight away because of the pin. And my opponent resigned here. I mean, it's over. Rook takes e4 is coming next. If f5, then knight takes e4, fe, rook takes e4 with checkmate. I mean, just totally crushing. So this shows you how dangerous the Alapin can be against, you know, this kind of casual play. Um, and that's how you should actually play against this line. Now here, of course, we decided to make the genius move bishop g5 and follow it up with an even more genius move bishop a6. And that's why the accuracy was so low. Yeah. So we immediately started the recovery process by going e5, posing concrete problems. I'm going to fast forward to the first interesting moment. Yeah, so queen h5, this is an idea. And again, using chess space, I can probably find for you guys an example of this idea being applied in a high-level game without a piece being sacrificed. Tuca against Capoblanca in a simul, a game which uh, Jose Rowe lose, loses. Now, it's funny because in the French, there is a line where white literally goes for this idea. e5, h6, this is the McCutcheon. Bishop d2 is the main line. And uh, white plays ef6, this is the old school line. A fg7, and there you go, queen h5. Queen f6, just like we had. Emilio, thank you for the sub. And after queen takes g7, guess what white plays? How does white open up the king side? h4. Exactly as we did. Takes, takes. Knight c6, castles long. Rook f4. Okay, white is obviously not, you know, super strong. And I wonder how Capablanca lost this game because at this point already Capablanca is in great shape. Oh, he blundered. I mean, he blundered several times. So here white finds a very, very nice move. Who sees it? White found a very, very pretty idea here that all of a sudden starts turning the table, tur turning the tables. Knight e4. Knight e4, this forks the bishop and the queen. This forces Capablanca to take, allowing the queen into the game. Knight d2. And now queen f4, another blunder. Amazing tactic by white again. What did white do in this position? I mean, this is so cool. White plays knight e4 on move 22. And now guess what white does again? Knight takes e4. You can't take because of bishop f3 skewering the queen to the checkmate. Queen is no squares. Look at this pawn on a3. If this pawn was on a2, black would have queen b4, defending b7. 
Can't do it here. Significance of every pawn and piece. That's why it's so important to make Luft, because in addition to making Luft, you're controlling before that could be an important square. Capablanca goes back to f5, panics, boom, takes, takes. And here, white can take the knight with an extra piece, but even stronger is queen d4, and Capablanca resigned. But this is how he lost the simul game. White was probably like 16, 1700. Those players can be dangerous in a simul. Okay, so queen, this was in a simul. Yeah, Capablanca would not lose to him in a normal game. So h4, opening up the king side. And obviously I castled here. I didn't mean to do that. Um, of course, we should have played knight f3. Here I think it would have been a lot more plausible that white black takes on g2. And after we castle, what is white's threat here? Well, white's threat is to play rook g1 and skewer the queen to the rook. Um, and if black continues grabbing pawns with queen takes f2, this is probably winning for black. This is probably um, winning for black, but, you know, we can play knight... I guess knight g5 gets forked with queen e3. Yeah, in fact, I think this is how black should play. Black should just grab all the pawns. Maybe we can go d5 here and try to open up the center. Actually, this is really interesting. Because if black tries to go rook g2 and checkmate us, we have queen h8 and d6 mate. Um, so it's situational completely. I mean, Luft is one of those things that you want to do 90% of the time, but you want to do it when you have time and when there are no greater priorities. What often happens is that you have greater priorities throughout the game, and by the end, you just didn't have time to make Luft, and that's how back rank stuff happens. That's how bad back rank stuff happens. It really depends on the situation. So, in any case, uh, Black didn't go Queen takes you 2 and he didn't go Queen g 5 check, which would have forced the Queen trade. What would I have done after the queen trade? I didn't have much in mind. I mean, this is just completely losing. Okay, knight e7, knight f3, developing. This should be 7. Luft just means error, I think, in German. And it just means a little hole for the king to avoid back rank mate. It doesn't just mean a3, by the way. That's a common misconception. Luft doesn't just mean h3. g3 or even h4 is also part of Luft, making Luft. Like Lufthansa. Yeah, the German airline. So knight e5. Um... Rook c8, rook up to d3, trying to swing it to g3, and uh, queen g5 check. So in this position, we go rook h7. This is as good of an attempt as any, and bishop e4 essentially wins the game. What should white do if we face bishop e4? Well, the only move here is rook h8 check. And after the rook drops back to g8, uh, who can tell me how white at least preserves some complexity in the position? Rook h3. But if you look very, very carefully, black has a devastating tactic in response. Black has a devastating tactic in response, and this essentially wins the game for black. H how should you be thinking about this? Well, what you should see is that the rook on h3 is overloaded. Anytime you have a situation like this where one piece is defending two different things on opposite sides of the board, thank you, Edog, for the sub, that's grounds for an overloading tactic. Boom. And the second thing to notice is that the knight on e7 is defending the c8 square. That's crucial. If there was a rook on e7, you would, be, you would have been checkmated on c8. Okay, we can play rook c7 here and hope for a miracle, but this is obviously completely lost. I mean, black can do a bunch of different things. Uh, for instance, black could even... You know, black can't castle. He's already moved his king. But we go and move like rook h2 and start picking off our pawns. Knights are amazing defenders, that's true. F6 is a big mistake, and after knight f7, the margin for error that black had shrinks tremendously. Rook d5 was absolutely obligatory, and as we were discussing, my move would have been rook g3, trying to get this rook as active as possible, as quickly as possible, get it to g7. Get it to g7. Uh, a Savage Muffin asks an interesting question. Could we have could black have played rook f5 as an alternative to f6? The answer is no. The reason is that the rook, when it moves from g5 to f5, loses control of the g8 square, which then allows us to give this check on h8. This is not mate. And after knight g8, in fact, black is probably still slightly better in this endgame. But obviously, this is like a dream. <laughs> We've won the piece back. So f6, knight f7. 
And yeah, rook d5 preserves a winning advantage, I'm sure of that. And after rook g3, how should black actually untangle? It's not so easy. I mean, I would have to think about this for a while. Black has already made his task very, very difficult. Because if black tries to cover the g7 square with knight f5, then we have a beautiful tactical idea. We can give a check on g8. And after king e7, there is mate, forced mate in this position. Who sees it? I think you can see it. You need to consider all of the knight discover checks and see which one leads to checkmate. Knight e5. Knight e5 is correct. Retreating knight moves, the hardest moves to find in chess. King d6 and rook takes d7 mate. Right? Now you might be sitting there, particularly if you're a beginner, how do I find this quickly? This is where you just need to solve puzzles. If you solve puzzles, you're going to get the hang of these patterns and you're going to eventually find these ideas automatically. That's just how it works. You can't think your way or learn your way into finding these mates quickly. You just have to solve. This is the hook mate, yeah. So after knight f5, we take on g5, we've won some material back, and now the move d5 blasting open the position. Okay, bishop d5 is impossible because of this. That's how I found the move. Oops, sorry. That's how I found the move. I, I recognize that the bishop is tied down to the rook. After e takes d5, congrats, uh, lucky. After e takes d5, the position opens up, making it a lot harder for black to focus his attention on our king. g4. And now I think the game-winning move is f4. This creates problems for black that are incredibly difficult to solve, even for a very strong player. I mean, already the position is very complicated. And after knight e4, I think the crucial moment, g6, king f8, was here. This is where you just have to be extremely patient. Identifying the threat. And by the way, what happens if black takes on c3 here? Well, here white has a very typical win. If the pawn is located diagonally from the king like this, rem remember the idea of rook h8 check, because the king can't approach the pawn, and now you play g7, g8. But not the immediate g7, because of king f7. The rook cannot move away without giving up the pawn. Okay, you, you can't do this because black just takes the pawn. You have to do it in the other order. Okay. Um, the engine says f4 is a huge blunder. Ask me if I care. Because I do not. I feel like f4 is a good practical move. We're in a situation where, you know, perhaps the engine finds some sort of uh, better approach for white, but I feel like, and I think you guys would agree with me, I don't even see a defense for black here, so I feel like that's a good litmus test for whether this is going to be a good resource at, you know, at a 13, 1400 level. And I don't mean that sarcastically. I think it's totally valid to analyze with an engine, but at some point, this is part of the reason behind the speeder, and I'm trying to get you guys to see what kinds of options are practically uh, are practically strong. Okay, so 94 g6, king f8, and after king b2, the blunder comes immediately. Knight f6 blunders the knight. Uh, on f6. What should black have done instead? I don't actually know. See, that's a case in point. Maybe rook c6. Maybe knight back around to g5. But then we just start vacuuming up pawns. We take d7. We can take a7. Perhaps this is the this is the correct approach, though. Bishop c6 and then maybe something like f3. And uh, maybe it turns out that black's pawn is stronger than white's. But the, the point, and this is beyond the scope of this particular game, we have done our job. We've complicated the game uh, from a position where we were a piece down. Um, and after knight f6, we don't really have to talk about this uh, end of the game, guys. I mean, I tried to ladder checkmate him. Uh, perhaps I had something more accurate. I honestly don't really feel like digging into this. I feel like we basically played well. Now, what would I do in a classical game? I would seriously contemplate just taking on d7, essentially, and, and just vacuuming up all the pawns, right? This is probably even a simpler approach. Thank you, Zena Soundbite. This is even a simpler approach, but I really wanted to stick with the idea of giving ladder mate, so that's why I kept trying to get my rook to the h file. Rook h8 is actually something I completely missed. Uh, and now we send our king forward. King c1, king d2, rook g5, threatening this very typical mating construction which you also have to remember by the way this is important as well anytime there's a piece on h3 usually a rook that blocks the king's escape backward you have this mating pattern now we continue pushing our king forward and guaranteeing passageway to g1 
Black should have gone king h1. This was the last chance. And here, I still was contemplating the move king f2. And after rook f6 check, my final question to you guys, what is my idea here? What can white try to do? Where should the king go? The blind swine main. Yeah, the king should go to g3, threatening rook h7, threatening rook h2. And my guess is that we're very, very close to winning the game. Rook h6. And now you can actually forget all about the ladder mate and instead go for the conventional. Probably rook c2 is better uh, because d1 is a light square. It can be guarded by the bishop. But rook c2 threatens rook c1 and that is just unstoppable. So combining all of these patterns is also an important skill to have in these situations. Okay, and that ends the game. I mean, in the game he played king h3, we walk our king back and deliver checkmate on h2. What about black d4 with pawn to open bishop up, asks Holmes was here. Where, when? He did that, Holmes. Oh, you mean at the end. So in case of king h1, king f2? Oh yeah, d4 here. Oh yeah, d4 here is a good move actually. But after rook g1, king h2, we can just play c takes d4. Essentially, we can take the pawn and then kind of restart the process. But you're right, this is probably black's best move. He was too late opening up the bishop. He tried doing that, but it was too late. This prevents king g1, but it doesn't prevent the second mate. Man, what a game. I think that was a, a successful, finally a successful attempt to, uh, to blunder a piece. And I hope you guys found that instructive. I know that this is a gap in the speedrun because I tend to get essentially winning positions out of the opening every time. So hopefully uh, this was helpful. And I'll definitely do this again, maybe to a lesser extent, uh, at, at a higher level. Maybe I'll do this again at 16, 1700 and see if we can somehow create enough complications to beat someone at that level as well. All right, guys. Thank you so much. Appreciate all the support, truly. And I'll see you guys tomorrow.